All right, thanks. Thanks for taking the time from a busy schedule. And uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about what we AI is doing with uh, with open source and, and software um, and um, and how that's impacting us. And I want to start by looking at AI systems are being deployed at scale, right? They're making decisions today at scale. They are already out in the wild and they're out of the research labs and they're affecting life in uh, surprising ways, at least for me, from some of the technologists in the room, they might be not surprised. But, you know, I, I looked at the story from this um, recently reported from the, by the New York Times, who the, guy, the father sent a picture of his child to his doctor through uh, a Google application on his phone and the child was, was naked. And what happened was that the AI system automatically detected child nudity and flagged it as, as um, abuse and hell broke loose. The AI make a hell for this, for this father. So the New York Times wrote a story about it and the headline is fantastic, but the way I read it is this, right? It's, there is a bug. There is clearly a bug in the system that AI in the AI system that Google deployed. And it's a very complex one. So uh, there are definitely problems inside how Google came to that decision of flagging and suspending the, the account of this father. But what interested me is more about what's happening in the AI system that led to that conclusion. And in order to make a better story and only for us, let's imagine that Google is out of the picture. And uh, um, let's imagine that the humans are not, uh, are not responsible for um, or the review process that flagged and, uh, and blocked the person, the father's account. But let's imagine that there was the meeting in the meeting room when, uh, when someone decided, oh, this is a great idea. We have this fantastic algorithm. It detects child nudity at such a precision that we can really let it rip and let it be autonomous. So this AI um, is deployed, locks accounts automatically, sends notifications to the police and says, hey, here's a child abuser. You got it. We got it. Go get him. Right. And uh, essentially, the, the, this corporation has, uh, imaginary corporation, has unleashed a very fast robot that makes judgment calls uh, involving the police and gets them wrong, gets the decision wrong. So. The bug is in there, but how do we fix it as a society? How, what do we need in terms of getting these corrected? And if you think about it, when we were, if this was simple software, when, when there is a bug in, in, in code that humans have written and uh, compiled and deployed on a machine, it, we have an answer. We know what to tell people. We know that we can, we have a framework to, to tell uh, that open source software is a better way to fix to to um, to deploy software to write software. We know that we've been saying that for over 20 years now, that open source is inherently better than proprietary software, and we know the rights of the developers. We write the rights of the users. We have frameworks, licenses, legal understanding of what needs to be done for software itself. But when it comes to AI, do we have the same understanding of what we need to fix a bug? In reality, it looks like there are many pieces that make an AI system that don't fall squarely in the open source definition. Like, for example, things like the, the original training data, where is the boundary between data and software itself? And many also, depending on the AI, like I'm really being uh, using the term in a very generous and wide way, many of these AI are black boxes. We don't understand what's happening inside, how they come to a conclusion. We cannot really inspect the, the networks inside that make the judgment calls. So if we want to apply the same open source principles to these black boxes and to the, to the case of the father, in this decision-making hell, uh, what should he demand? Right? To, so, dear Google, send me the code, send me the source code. Uh, but what's the source code in this case? Or uh, how about the police? The police is now receiving on the receiving end of lots of decisions, lots of um, uh, signaling that said, saying 
go get this person, he's a child abuser. But now they understand, also they, they, they recognize that 80%, let's say, of these, of these calls are bogus. So what should the police tell Google, the hypothetical Google? Uh, how are you gonna fix your bug in, in your system? You need to do this, you need to do that, right? What are these conclusions? So we need to take a little bit of a step back and understand what's in this, what goes into the uh, automated decision making. And, you know, that's, I like to think about pictures because I'm, a, I'm an architect, I'm not really a developer. But in the old days, when you snapped a picture, you then upload it into your own computer and you had to spend lots of time cataloging and, and trying to add some metadata like tags, try to understand whether you were, you were at the place, you were at birthday, someone's birthday or something. And the software, like in this case, the Gnome's uh, Shotwell, there's no knowledge of what's inside the picture. But we do have the knowledge of what came into building Shotwell very precisely. We have a list of dependencies, we have the licenses, we, have, we know the rights that we have for all, each of the packages that go into it. If we find bugs, we know who to blame, we know how to fix it, we know where to file an issue. Uh, we know everything, uh, basically. But when it comes to the modern, picture managers like Google's or photo, uh, uh, Google Photos or Apple Photos, they see the pictures. They have a way to understand um, friends, places, family members, and um, they recognize pizza from pasta very reliably. And there is something though in that black box, right? So I have a little bit of a clip here of a documentary. Okay, so, uh, that that was that was an episode of Silicon Valley. If you haven't recognized a, a TV show, if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. It really depicts the life on Silicon Valley of a startup. But there are two important quotes in that piece. They say that the core tech uh, needs to be fed a lot of data, a lot of images and labels in order to be uh, successful in order to be doing its job, right? The, the quickly doing the, the this machine that recognizes pizza, hot dog, was simple. And not hot, hot dog, very simple. The rest of it is hard, right? And uh, the other thing that that is important in that episode that I show in the clip, it's that Creating that data set, so collecting all those images, is boring and expensive. So who wants to do, do who wants to do that? Who's got the capacity to do that? And I think that this is the answer. Right? Large corporations have that capacity. They, the 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 web the web uh, search I mean the, the search engines they scrape the internet all the time. They have a tremendous head start in that. They've been collecting our data for a long time, and uh, they you know think of all. The pictures that you've been uploading since before Facebook or existed before MySpace. I lost track of all the pictures that I put online. And you know, nowadays also with phones, mobile phones, those are uh, basically sensors in the world doing this work all automatically all the time. So when uh, when we look at a pipeline that generates AI systems, we have data on coming in at one hand and decisions uh, coming at the other end of the spectrum. And if something goes wrong in this pipeline, you go to jail or someone gets denied a loan or you get denied something else. Like the, the, there are very, the systems deploy that scale, making lots of fast decisions all the time. If there is something wrong, um, the developers have a tremendous responsibility. And that's one of the reasons why the governments around the world are both excited and concerned, very concerned about the general availability of these tools. So when you go back to the example of the father, the police and, and the society, how do we protect each other and how do we uh, ask for a fair AI, probably we need to have access to all these elements for in order to be able to fix and, and understand the AI but we also need the hardware to rebuild and test that we are done, we fix the issue. Um, is that all or is that enough? I, I don't know, but it looks to me like we are at a starting point, at least understanding what the pieces are. And the main issue is that we don't have really as a society, a guiding principles, uh, a guardrail uh, for 
to, to orient the conversation and to drive the conversation the same way that we had the GNU manifesto or later the open source definition to orient the conversations about how the interaction between citizens and governments or, or between each other mediated by the digital space. And everything, everyone is moving at, a, at their own pace. Corporations uh, with their own self-interest, governments with their own interests, uh, academia is also moving at its own pace. So what about us? What about the open source communities? What are we doing? With the, these were the questions that led the open source initiative to launch Deep Dive AI, which is a three part event to uncover uh, the peculiarities of AI systems and start establishing those boundaries, or at least start to, to understand where we're gonna have to put the guard layer, guardrails to orient the conversation and um, to, or, to define the open source in the context of AI. And here are the, uh, what we discovered so far. The first thing is that the in a model, the, so the output of the training may not be copyrightable. It's not covered by copyright, so at least not in the US. So, but we are, or developers and, and researchers, corporations that are sharing the models uh, publicly, they have been putting open source software licenses, or in other words, the licenses that were meant to be used for open source software. Is that the right thing to do or, or not? The other thing that is funny is that the output of the model itself is not covered by copyright. And that raises a very interesting question, especially with the release of the new uh, stable diffusion model. Stable diffusion has been trained on copyrighted data. Therefore, when you ask it to, like in this case, uh, show me a, create a picture of Mickey Mouse going to the US Congress, Here's what it spits out. It looks exactly like Mickey Mouse. That image is not covered by copyright, but I bet you that the moment someone writes a comic book uh, with these pictures, Disney will not let it pass. So we'll have a test case. It's, it's a peculiarity of AI. The other, um, the other thing is that, the, the, that we learned is that the European Union is, uh, legislating already on AI. The AI Act is a very interesting read. It's still in draft and it's probably going to take another uh, some time. I don't know how long, but it's going to take a while before it gets approved. But it has a very interesting, um, uh, it, I, I, it's based on risk and it has um, already identified two uses of AI that have to be completely banned because they're just too risky. The first one is subliminal messages need to be removed. And I see the eyes of some of you on there, like what subliminal messages? My interpretation is that the, the, the legislator here is concerned about tools that may be able to steer votes. And I think that, you know, the legislators have seen some examples recently about this happening. And um, the other prohibited use is the uh, the um, systems for recognition, face recognition, fundamentally, or biometric recognition in real time, except for um, public, public safety uh, uses. And I think here also the concern might be around being, you know, walking around, being recognized by a corporation and getting on the, and uh, associated with a profile online and automatically get you know disturbing notifications on your phone to buy something or something like that probably um, then there are a bunch of other high risk um, system ai systems that classify as high risk and these are things like autopilots uh, for for cars and here it's interesting to read the legislation because it really requires a bunch of testing and validation and stresses on these, these um, concepts that are very rudimentary even in research fields. So it's really, it really feels like, you know, it's a high risk, we recognize it, we need to test it, we need to make sure they work, but at the same time, not even the research community knows exactly how to test and validate and make sure that these, these things work. So um, it, it's an inter interesting space to watch. Now, one more thing that we've learned is that these data sets 
the large data sets that are publicly available, the, the, the most visible ones, more recent and visible ones, they're taken from the web. They're collected by scraping massive of publicly available data and available to the public under licenses that are a mix match of everything that you find in the web, right? So imagine yourself, the, the problems that you got into when uh, you downloaded a piece of software and you put it into your own software and you were like, and then, and then someone told you like, oh no, you cannot do that. You need to read the license first. Well, now we have machines assembling petabytes of images of dubious provenance. And dubious provenance, not only for the legal rights associated with uh, the uses of these images, code, text, but also the content itself, which includes porn, harassment, uh, racism, all sorts of weird stuff that you can find on the web if you, if you don't look careful, if you're not careful about your filters, right? And it's also data that, is been produced, that has been produced by wealthier and skewed um, set of the world population, right? Much of issues, many issues. The other thing that was very interesting is to, when I spoke with one of the developers of this uh, hacker com community uh, called Eleuther AI, and um, the, 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 there's a podcast episode about it. It's really about the damages that the AI can do once unleashed in the world. And they, they, can, get, create, they can create real problems very, very quickly. Um, one of for if you deep deep fakes is one of these conversations that that we that one of the tools that we talked about where you impose the face of someone over the body of someone else and many tools are capable of creating realistic porn with uh, you know uh, you, you you know uh, famous actress over the body of, of, of a porn actress and the the quality of these tools, you know, faking voices, faking, faking environments, uh, simulating all this sort of stuff are becoming very hard to distinguish from, from reality and tricking even sometimes trained and skilled professionals. So the, um, the other one is the stop button problem, which I was not aware of. Like there are machines that, are, that can be trained to win a game and they can be uh, become um, so aware of the fact that they need to win that are can be resisting to being stopped and maybe today is a science fiction scenario but if you you know if you think about the skynet that uh, or or other uh, science fiction ais that that hide hide or replicate their code in order not to be stopped it, this is a mathematically a problem that exists and and research communities are aware of so the, the final um, piece of the puzzle is that there is a there is a problem with the hardware, where for to build these big AI models and the word big means really big, like gigabytes and petabyte terabytes of of text, which are very hard to put together, and and when it comes to images and videos, it's even more like petabyte and petabytes of data. To train these models, you need you need expensive hardware that is not um, readily available, easy easy to put together. And for this hardware, there are no the op there is no real open source stack. For example, uh, to to put together a cluster of parallel GPUs, you need you need the leading the leading uh, tech platform is Nvidia, the CUDA the CUDA system, and large pieces of CUDA are not open source. There are some newcomers like AMD, Intel. They're doing they're doing a good job and they're releasing open source pieces. But still, there there is no there is no full the ecosystem is not mature. Eventually, this piece I'm sure that will be solved because the push to open source uh, down the stack to the hardware I think is really hard and we've seen it making progress in the past very effectively. But I'm still confident, but I'm still concerned about the rest of it. Like the hardware itself is expensive. It's not the hands of, of hackers by themselves. And the knowledge to set up these large clusters is, is rare. And, and I think that these are the real issues uh, uh, that we find in AI. The, the amount of data that is required, finding the data, curating it, make sure it has no bias. The conditions, the legal conditions 
for using this raw data are not clear. The models themselves, uh, what's in that model, what goes in it, how do we inspect it, how do we fix it, how do we uh, realize that there are issues before we deploy it? How do we stop it in case it gets out of control? The knowledge that is necessary to set up these clusters and, and uh, fix these models for retraining the hardware, which is scarce and relies on a proprietary ecosystem, but also th things like how are the AI systems being deployed? They are full of disappointing, I mean, big promises and, and disappointing results. Think, so, think of the autopilot inside, called autopilot inside one famous car. And, and the thing that is also not clear to me is are the social norms of the AI community. These, there doesn't seem to be a shared understanding or unanimous understanding of what is an acceptable behavior about scraping the web for images, for example, or text. And um, what's preventing, what is the stopper to prevent for a, a, a research group to publish a paper that describes something more efficiently, but also has clearly or unclearly a very dangerous use down the line. So I could stop the presentation here, but I'm assuming that many of you will want to know about Copilot, which has been a big topic of conversation for many of you. And as a full disclaimer, GitHub is a sponsor of OSI and is a sponsor of Deep Dive AI. It's the top sponsor of Deep Dive AI, the research that we're doing. That does not prevent me from speaking badly about the Copilot or doing anything. I, I mean, I can do anything I want. We are Open Source Initiative is a public charity. We are and work in the, inter, in the interest of the public. And if we don't, we the, the tax authority of the United States removes our our status. So we're very careful about not giving a damn, uh, thanking the sponsors, but then reminding them that we work for the public. So that said, I've said it before I accepted the money from GitHub, that I don't care about Copilot. I really don't. No, it's a piece of the larger picture of what we've been talking about before. It's only interesting Copilot to me in terms of, as, as a part of the larger conversation. The other reason why I don't care that much is because there is a lot of other groups that are looking at Copilot from the functional perspective. Does it work? Does it work well? Is it fulfilling the promise? Is it doing a good thing in terms of Copilot and not the other code generative um, um, tools? There, there is, there's many other that work in the same fashion. Does it save time for developers? That kind of stuff. And these details, to me, they're important, but they're smaller compared to the larger picture of, of AI. So, because we, we at OSI, We've been thinking about how the new technologies have been affecting the world that we live in and changing also and shaping the perception of, the, of what our principles, how our principles apply to, to these new technologies. And, and I want to remind everyone that when the open source definition, but before the open source definition, the GNU manifesto was written, Software was a very new thing. In the 80s, software was appearing for the first time as, as an artifact that could be sold separately from software. And it was that pull, pull from the research labs at the MIT AI labs, uh, funny enough, that was privatizing what was shared knowledge inside the lab the software was being taken away and privatized into corporations. That's what triggered Richard Stallman to think about the moral imperative of keeping the commons in the commons, in the science labs, in, in the society, so that we could move faster, accelerate evolution of, of the computer science that was a nascent field. He wrote the GNU manifesto way before the license was written, the, the GNU GPL license, at least four or five years before. So we are at the same place now in history, if you want, of, with AI. AI is being pulled out of the labs. It's coming into fruition. Some people, some corporations are privatizing it, immediately deploying it. There is something wrong in there. 
because the reasons that I explained, the bias in the, in the tools, the, the, the lack of clarity, lack of transparency, we need to know, we need to understand how and if the principles of open source that were codified 25 years ago can be applied to the new, to the new field of AI. And that's my presentation. I wanna hear from you uh, if you have any questions. I repeat. Um, I'm from the Netherlands, and maybe you've seen the news, but we had some issues with systems uh, ruining people uh, the way they uh, were programmed, mm -hmm. basically. And I can see the same happening with AI. But what I noticed that when the issue is known, it's very hard to switch off the system because it fulfills a, uh, fulfills a certain role in a, in, a, in, a, yeah, in a process. And if you remove that system, it's not as easily replaced. And so there's a tendency to keep the system alive while building something else. How do you see that as an issue as well? Okay, so the, the question is whether how, how to replace systems that are buggy, whether they're software or AI or other things. Yeah, that comes from the social norms, in my opinion. It is, it's the what's acceptable by society comes before uh, defining, writing the laws. So if the writing the laws and the legal licenses as an example. So, you know, the Netherlands is in, in the society has been accepting a lot of broken systems because, but you know, like any other society, you accept the broken system because in the end they, they bring you some, some, other, uh, some other benefits or because removing it will create more damage than, than keeping up something that is running, running off. So, the answer to me lies into having conversations with the, the society, assessing the benefits, the doubts, you know, and, and trying to fix them. Uh, probably goes beyond the technology. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yes. Um, I have a question about licensing. Um, uh, Stable Diffusion was released under an interesting license, which is kind of open source, but also prevents or mm -hmm. tries to prevent. Yeah. I, mean, I, I would know that you would refuse it as an open source license for code, but right. how do you feel about yeah, that's it. For, that, for AI and stuff? Yeah, that's an interesting topic. So the question is, um, if what are my thoughts around the responsible AI license that has been uh, uh, used to distribute um, the components of uh, Stable Diffusion, one of the famous newer ones, large models. Uh, I, I think it's an interesting experiment, and uh, I look at it with a lot of um, with a lot of interest because, and in fact, uh, one of the authors and, and main proponents of the Rail uh, Responsible AI license is going to be a guest in the panel um, in that we'll have next month about deep dive AI. The reason why I look at them in, with interest, and the reason why on Twitter I reply, "Do not judge this license." with uh, the open source angle because it's wrong. The, the model, the rail license applies to things that are not software. So we really don't have a framework to judge the openness of this license. We need to understand, um, so that said, the content of the license itself basically it has a bunch of limitations about the downstream use. I think that they have their own to something. Um, to be honest, because some they know the damage that this stable AI system can do, and uh, I wasn't not in the room when they decided to release it, and they decided to release it so full of everything, like the weights and the training sets, I, everything is released. The fact that is out there for anyone with the knowledge to to replicate um, could create problems. It's like having the deep fake software that is completely open source with no boundaries. And at least in the deep fake software community, they have made it clear, they have a social, at least, you know, they have made it clear by, by themselves that they will not support anyone who's coming to their forums with requests to help them create fake porn. 
uh, but but so on the on the on the rail uh, license there is something in there like they're trying to they know that their software can be used for their, their systems can be used for damaging purposes and they want to be able to to at least you know project that idea that that uh, doing good needs to be embedded into the heads of the people really doing this this research and doing this work so I, I find it fascinating. We will get to, I'm hoping that by the end of the panel discussions next month, we will have a better a shared understanding between the open source, let's say classical community of software, our principles, our, our needs, why we prevent, um, why we say in the open source definition that you cannot prevent, uh, that you cannot restrict uses that you cannot mm, uh, restrict who the users are also, you cannot discriminate. Those are in there for good reasons because that's been enabling this ec ecosystem. If we remove those, we know that we're gonna be putting barriers to the low friction sharing of knowledge and information in form of source code. Do we want the same speed? Do we need the same uh, effects as a society for AI systems, I think we need to have a better, a larger and more deeper conversation before we say on Twitter, this is not open source, I don't want to do it. I don't want to deal with it. Don't use it. Not ready for, for that. I don't think we are. When um, evaluating software or AI, we usually strive for per per perfection and um, try to reduce the number of issues, bugs, and errors that the AI is making. Uh, whereas if we look at humans, we accept errors and we more look uh, at how can we appeal to those errors and then go mm, for a trial and like um, right. conversation, how, how do we s solve that issue? Right. Um, are there also um, like movements or conversations in the legal area to make a legal um, framework for AIs to become an entity um, <laughs> that we can appeal to? That's a very interesting point. So the, if AI can be treated as, as a human, so fallible, and when it's fallible, basically go to court or go to some other way of, of appealing and, and fixing later. Uh, that, that's an interesting point. I think that the, the whole um, I haven't seen legislation going into that direction, but I do have, um, there are lots of conversations with ethicists and philosophers of different disciplines um, looking at, at this issue of how, how an, to treat an AI as an entity because it, it will soon become an issue with um, insurances, right? There is, there are, um, you know, robots walking around the sidewalks in San Francisco for, to deliver food. Right, those are autonomous. If you step on it and fall, whose fault it is? Uh, if you, you know, driving cars, self-driving cars, that's another big deal. Like if they come into an accident, who are you going to sue and who's going to take the responsibility for that? So now they're going, the corporations are going around this by putting a, a human on remote control or maybe physically behind the, the little cart on the sidewalk uh, because that's going to be the, the agent uh, responsible for if anything happens but in the future we may have to have larger larger conversation again this is very it's a very beginning of a new thing and if it keeps on going at the speed that it's been going we'll have bigger problems and we need to have these conversations now yep uh, I'm fully interested in the, um, concept of fairness. the of what the concept of fairness. fairness yes Uh, yeah, so the, the question is around fairness, is, if, is there any evidence that the models developed in, in open collaborative environments are better? Um, I, I don't know, honestly. I, I'm, not, I'm not aware. Um, I, I, I might assume so, but that's one of the things that I would like to find out. You know, if it's, if it's true, then that definitely it, it is a recommendation of, of the open source initiative, would be a recommendation. One of the guiding frameworks is the, the guardrails that we want to put in. Is exactly that you know the models need to be uh, trained on fair data because if you have unfair data then the model will be unfair there's no question around it so 
fair? How do you measure fair? There is research though going into measuring the fairness, me measuring the, the, the amount of bias um, technically. I don't know how to do it. It could be snake oil, snake oil again, but there, you know, uh, the, the researchers and, and practitioners that I talk to, they, they give that problem as a problem that can be fixed. Any more questions? Yeah. So um, we've seen kind of both sides of, you mentioned earlier about the, the toddler fiction art, we've seen both sides of how we deal with that, we've seen just let the AI deal with it, but we also see, for example, like Facebook or Meta hire people to look at the images after the AI has classified them and say this is offensive, here's what actions can be taken and all that. Do you think that's sustainable in the future, the idea of still hiring people to validate what the AI looks at or to more towards the AI should be more trustworthy, we should be able to understand that what comes out of the AI yeah. should be more fallible in terms of the law or whatever. Yeah, so the question is whether uh, the, the model that is applied now to judge the fairness of the results of AI is uh, done by humans and if that, that's an scalable model or something that can be automated uh, afterwards. I'm hoping that it will get to the point when we can safely use AI. And by safely, I mean that we have predictable, deterministic um, results uh, that, that can be tested out. So in, in the pipeline, when you do the testing, you actually know and, and you know how to investigate. And I, I think that eventually we might get there, depending, because there I've, I've read that there are ways to inspect a deep neural network, understand the maths inside it, and change its mind to some extent. You know, if the, the system has been trained to recognize that the Tour Eiffel is in Paris, uh, researchers, researchers have demonstrated that they can change the math inside the network to make it respond that the Tour Eiffel is in Rome. So if we get to the point where this inspectability exists and this the fixing inside the model directly, uh, there are tools that are advanced enough then we may not need to have this human this human check. The black box effect will disappear. Yep. So is the tool to inspect it to control uh, the vulnerability of this system so it can be misused or uh, affected by evil parts? <laughs> uh, repeat the question, and I'm uh, not sure I understand. It's not really a question, it's just... Uh, oh, a comment. <laughs> so you were saying uh, that the comment is, if we know what's happening inside the block, black box, then we can fix it, we can, we can, uh, we have instruments and tools to, to avoid evil, evil uses? Uh, not only no. Not only okay. debugger, I can debug, uh, find the bug or introduce the bug. Oh, yes, of course, of course, yes. You can manipulate from the outside. Then we get into a different, a different, uh, different scenarios and then we get into the... Well, the same with software, right? With confidential computing and and and, and clubs and yes. All right, I got one minute. Anything from the from remote? Um, there's a question that says, "What do you think about biotelemetry data being used for sample and temperature detection in COVID?" Oh, so collection of large collections uh, of of biometric data, so. Again, we go, it's such a big field that that so th these AI systems that they require lots of data. So collecting data is part is has not been something that the open source initiative has ever looked at. It's the data realm is more into Creative Commons, open knowledge, uh, other uh, op other groups and and uh, and, and, and uh, association, but. Uh, it, this is a place where we will be colliding and, and, and put the, putting together a lot of different worlds. So that QR code is for the panel uh, discussions and in the panel conversations we will have people from Creative Commons, the EFF, Wikimedia Foundation, Mozilla Foundation and many other groups that have been in the field of open source and open knowledge, open data in order to, um, in order to build together uh, a conversation around understanding the AI and putting guidelines that are safe and good for the society, the same way that we've done with open source. So, thanks everyone. I'm at time. <laughs>